Uh, I'm Dan Reed, I'm the Senior VP for Academic Affairs at the U, but uh, in the Monty Python spirit, I want to talk about something completely different today, uh, and that's my trip to Antarctica. I'm a member of the U.S. National Science Board, which is responsible for um, scientific research in a big chunk of uh, the portfolio of the U.S., and one of its responsibilities is oversight for the U.S. presence in Antarctica. Uh, and I spent about 10 days there uh, at the end of last year, and I just wanted to share a little bit about the experience uh, and be happy to answer a few questions uh, at the end. So uh, with that, let me jump in and um, just say um, one of the things that's true is it's a heck of a long way to Antarctica. Uh, I flew from Salt Lake City to Auckland, New Zealand via LAX, and then on to Christchurch, that's about 7,500 miles. And once you get there, it's still 2,500 miles to McMurdo Station. McMurdo is uh, the green circle at the bottom right there. I'll tell you a little bit about that station, which is where most of the U.S. presence is. Uh, also tell you about a trip to the South Pole, and then I'll talk some about uh, glacier issues and, and Antarctic melting and sea ice, which I know was part of a question some folks were curious about, and it's an important scientific issue. I was there with a couple of other science board members uh, to take a look at the facilities. Uh, and in general, uh, at the research facilities in Antarctica, there are really only three groups of people there. The folks conducting scientific research, logistics and support staff, uh, and then a few occasional visitors uh, like me. Um, and what does it take to get there? Well, I'll talk about the logistics in a moment. Um, but in order to go, one has to go through a fairly extensive set of physical exams, uh, have all your immunizations up to date, uh, have dental checks, and you might wonder why. Well, part of it is the nearest healthcare is 2,500 miles away. There is a very small clinic stashed there. Uh, so for minor things, there is healthcare support. Uh, and a dental hygienist who doubles as a dentist in case you have dental emergencies. So best um, uh, not to do that. Uh, and in winter, uh, evacuation is extraordinarily difficult because there are no, no air flights to Antarctica and it's totally icebound. Um, so to uh, evacuate someone actually requires others to risk their lives. So there's a real focus on people going, being in good health for those reasons. Uh, I was there in um, late November and early December, which is really the height of summer in Antarctica. Um, and the transport there are, um, as I'll show you in a moment, uh, both C-17 jets, uh, but most commonly LC-130s, and those are the ski versions of the venerable C-130 military cargo plane. It is uh, a unique environment. Um, this is Mount Erebus. Uh, which was first scaled by Shackleton's crew. Uh, and I'll say a word about that in a moment. That's right by uh, McMurdo Station. And I'll show you some pictures of the dry valleys. We tend to think of Antarctica as snow and ice covered, but there are substantial parts of the continent that are in fact almost precipitation free. And you can see a great picture uh, of that uh, here on, uh, on the right. But sort of put things in context, at the turn of the last century, uh, there was really the age of heroic exploration when explorers were vying to be the first to reach the South Pole. Uh, and one of the first to try those was Ernest Shackleton. Uh, in 1907, 1909, he got as close to the pole uh, as anyone had ever gotten, uh, less than 100 geographical miles from the pole. Uh, but it had to turn back. Uh, and that was the Nimrod expedition, and we'll see uh, Shackleton's uh, provision hut uh, in just a bit. Uh, the person who made it uh, was Roald Amundsen, uh, and he made it in, in November of 2011 uh, with a group of sledges pulled by dogs. Uh, they went overland and arrived um, uh, and completed that uh, uh, journey to the pole on December 14th of that year. Um, just a few months uh, later, there was a race and uh, 
Robert Scott made an attempt at the poll. He led a group of five ultimately, um, it was called the Terra Nova Expedition. Um, and they arrived in the poll just literally weeks later, uh, January 17th of 2012. Uh, on the way back, um, they ran out of supplies, died just a few miles from their last food depot, uh, and just a little more than 100 miles from arriving back uh, at McMurdo Station. There's a famous British story about a, a, an officer who accompanied a group uh, named Lawrence Oates uh, near the end of the journey where they lost their lives, the cold out of food, uh, Oltz had been suffering from frostbite and gangrene in his feet and knowing that he was slowing the party down and might be the reason they didn't make it. He simply got up one night and said to his colleagues in very British fashion, I'm just going outside. I may be quite some time. And he sacrificed his life in the hope that the parties would make it. Uh, alas, they did not. Uh, and that was, that was the Scott expedition of late 2011, 2012. Uh, and so this quote at the bottom sort of captures the spirit of the times. Uh, Raymond Priestley said, uh, for scientific discovery, give me Scott. For efficiency of travel, give me a Munson. Uh, but when disaster strikes and all hope is gone, get down on your knees and pray for Shackleton. And part of the reason that's true is the story we now know today which was not about reaching the South Pole, but a later expedition that Shackleton launched. Uh, and it was called the Imperial Transarctic uh, Antarctic Expedition in 1914. The goal was to transit the continent. There's a famous story uh, about Shackleton having placed an ad in the London newspapers uh, seeking volunteers for the journey. Uh, and the story has that this is what the ad said. Men wanted it for a hazardous journey, small wages, bitter cold, long months of complete darkness, constant danger, safe return doubtful, but honor and recognition of case of, of success. Now the advertisement's never been found. It's almost certainly an apocryphal story, but it says a lot about the spirit to motivate people to go on these kinds of journeys. It's the same spirit that, uh, you know, Henry V, uh, um, mouthed in Shakespeare's play, the St. Crispin speech, we few, we happy few, we band of brothers. It's a story as much about ourselves as it is about the explorers themselves. And of course, Shackleton's uh, endurance ship was crushed in the ice, an extraordinary story about him rescuing all of his men. If you haven't followed that story, there's great books, there's a wonderful movie song, Kenneth Branagh, I would highly recommend. It's an amazing story of perseverance. But enough about history. Let me tell you about the journey. After I arrived in uh, Christchurch, there is an Antarctic center, which includes partnerships with the New Zealanders, but several other countries as well. Step zero is go and get your winter gear. Uh, and so you can see on the right, uh, um, the teammates who went with me to Antarctica, um, and what is winter gear? Well, it looks like this. You get to take two bags and two bags only, and you can see them in the upper right there to Antarctica because cargo is precious and fuel is precious uh, to reach uh, uh, McMurdo Station. So what would typical be outerwear? Well, it would be thermal underwear, pants and a shirt, an insulated zip up top, which is one of those black things there, insulated pants, that's the other black thing, thermal socks, moon boots, the big white boots there, uh, the big red jacket, affectionately known as Big Red, uh, because all the Americans uh, at the Pole and in McMurdo uh, have red jackets, uh, and then inner and outer gloves and goggles. Uh, and I can tell you at the Pole, I wore every one of those and I was as cold as I have ever been. Uh, and remember this is summer in Antarctica where at the pole in summer, it's a balmy minus 25 uh, and it can reach minus 70 to minus 80 in the winter. Uh, and with the wind howling, you can imagine what the wind chill folks feels like. And as I said, that was, that was winter, uh, sorry, that was summer. So from there, um, we waited multiple days for the weather to clear um, to depart to Antarctica, to McMurdo Station from Christchurch. 
Um, and um, it's about five hours by a C-17 jet that you can see here in this picture. It's about seven hours by um, LC-130 uh, prop plane. Um, these planes are mostly filled with cargo bound for McMurdo uh, and then in some cases bound for the pole. Uh, it's also the transit vehicle for workers and scientists going uh, to McMurdo and on to other research destinations. We were fortunate to be on the last uh, C-17 flight of the season. Uh, there are only a couple of C-17s that fly this route um, and are operated by um, um, the, the New York Air National Guard. Um, and then most of the other transport is by um, uh, LC-130. Um, so here's the happy band uh, uh, about to board. Uh, and you can see the interior of the plane uh, on the right in these pictures, uh, we're off for adventure. Uh, everyone's excited having waited multiple days for the weather to clear. But most of the interior of the plane looks like this. Uh, as I said, it's filled with cargo. Uh, there were some crates on there I was looking at and they were from uh, US researchers. Uh, when I later boarded a plane to go to the South Pole, some of those same crates were on that plane. Uh, they were scientific cargo destined for, um, uh, for the uh, Scott Amundsen station uh, at, the, at the South Pole. So about five hours later, we landed at uh, what's called Phoenix Field. Um, Phoenix Field is an 11,000 foot runway. It's a snow packed runway. It's constructed every year from scratch, uh, given the snowfall there, um, capable of accommodating um, uh, the C-17 and also um, LC-130s, though there's another field, Willie's Field, where uh, those ski planes typically land. Um, so you can tell that it's relatively warm. Uh, in fact, the day we landed at McMurdo Station, it was just about freezing. It was about 32 degrees. So a relatively um, warm at McMurdo for uh, even for that time of year. Uh, the runway um, is about a 30 minute ride uh, by van uh, from Phoenix Field on an ice road. Uh, it's marked by uh, ice poles uh, uh, and um, you know every attempt to make sure that people don't get lost in the snow. I can certainly tell you on later trips back to the field, it was snowing so hard and visibility was so low that absent the ice poles, we really would not have been able to find our way. It would have been easy to drive off the track uh, and become totally lost. Uh, what you see in the picture here is a set of uh, dormitories, uh, the brown buildings. Uh, during the peak of the season at McMurdo Station, uh, the, the primary U.S. base in, in uh, Antarctica, there are about 1,200 people there. Uh, the overwhelming uh, group of those folks are logistic support of one time, uh, uh, one kind or another. And you'll see in a few pictures in a moment just how much logistics there is. Everything there has to come in by air, uh, with the exception of one, maybe two ships a year that are able to dock in the harbor when uh, uh, following an icebreaker in the summer season. Uh, that's where heavy equipment or other materials that are you know, obviously too heavy for flight uh, are brought in. And you can just see the nature of the logistics here. Um, the station's really dominated by logistics. Um, Scott Base, which is operated by New Zealand, is, is almost uh, uh, next door to McMurdo Station. Uh, you can see the massive fuel tanks there. Fuel is the coin of the realm. It is gold uh, in Antarctica because it's the source of power for generators, for electricity and heat. Uh, it's the fuel that drives ground vehicles in the area. Uh, it's obviously the fuel for helicopters and for airplanes, uh, and both for local logistics and also to support flights to the pole. Uh, really interesting thing about fuel, planes that fly into McMurdo try to arrive as full as possible and fuel is pumped off of them. Uh, and uh, they try to return to Christchurch as empty as possible uh, just because fuel is so precious and it's hard to actually reach uh, McMurdo 
uh, with fuel by ship and, and by plane. I'll come back to what it means to land IPTI uh, uh, near the end of the talk because it was, a, it was an interesting experience. Um, here's another look at the station. Um, you can, I'll just tell you what a few buildings are there, but let me start with an interesting tidbit about protecting the environment. Um, the gray building you see at the left there is actually the sanitary sewer system. Uh, everything that is waste is either shipped out or flown out of McMurdo. And that includes um, the output of the sanitary sewer system. It is dried and it's packaged and it's shipped out. It's true of garbage and trash as well. The water that's discharged back into, uh, into the bay uh, is far cleaner than any international standard uh, would require. Uh, and that's been a big point of pride uh, for the US delegation to protect the environment there. Um, so that gray building on the left with the red circle is the sewer plant. And yes, I got a tour of that too. Uh, the Z-shaped building on the right is the main science center where most on-site science takes place. The light blue building is the cafeteria. There's only one cafeteria on campus. Everyone eats there uh, in shifts. Uh, and the small white building sort of in the center left uh, is the chapel at McMurdo Station. There are other logistic services there. Um, as I mentioned, there's a really small clinic with a couple of rotating physicians and a nurse slash um, a dental hygienist slash dentist. Uh, there's a fire station. Fire is a very real risk there, uh, given the cold and the heating. There are two fire stations, uh, sorry, two fire engines. There's a machine shop because all repairs and uh, uh, materials have to be basically created on, on site in order to keep the vehicles running. And for those folks who go on expeditions from McMurdo, there's a major tent and supply shop uh, that both uh, um, repairs tents and facilities and packages those uh, for expeditions. This was my home away from home, this little dormitory there on the left. Um, the, the rooms are two people each, um, each with single beds. There's a bathroom down the hall with a shower um, internet service uh, in um, McMurdo Station exists, but it's very limited. If you sort of think about being at the bottom of the world, all the satellites are very low on the horizon. And so internet service is really not great. Um, it was one of those things that sending one of these pictures back home uh, might have taken four or five hours. That's the kind of bandwidth there was. Uh, mail delivery, as you would expect, depends on air service and, and the quality of the weather. As I said, there's a single cafeteria uh, for everyone, um, all 1,200 plus at the height of the season. Um, and as you would expect for people working in a really hostile environment, uh, doing a lot of strenuous work, uh, fairly high carb food, limited fresh vegetables and, and fresh fruits because they all have to come in uh, really by air. I mentioned there's a chapel um, that I circled earlier. Um, these are a couple pictures of it. You can see it was just before the end of your holidays, so there's a Christmas tree up. Uh, it's an interface chapel. Uh, welcome to people of all religious beliefs. Uh, the chaplain also serves as a camp counselor and, and mental health uh, supporter. Um, and as you would imagine for uh, some people, uh, the isolation can be challenging, particularly in overwinter when really there is no way to get in or out. And the smaller crew, uh, after the summer season leaves, uh, people are really um, tightly bound there for four to six months uh, until the, the spring season comes back around again. Let me say a little bit about science uh, because that was the reason I was there. Uh, and one of you in the pre-questions asked really about uh, glaciers and, uh, and sea ice melting. There's a large international research collaboration um, looking at the Thwaites Glacier. And as you can see in the diagram here, uh, the Thwaites Glacier um, is over, um, Trying to get to see if I can make my pointer work, maybe not. That's okay. Um, is in the um, kind of the uh, the left center of Antarctica. Um, it's 
It is the fastest melting glacier uh, in West Antarctica. Uh, and here's why you might actually care. Uh, if it were to melt, it would contribute half a meter to global sea rise levels. So think 20 inches rise in global sea levels if this glacier calves uh, and melts. Uh, so, but trying to understand what's going on there, given this rapid melting, uh, is the is an international science collaboration it involves researchers from the U.S., from the U.K., and and other institutions around the world. Uh, and let me just show you an example of of part of the research that we saw. Um, this submersible that you can see here is called IceFin. Uh, it's a project uh, and technology developed by Georgia Tech. Um, the idea is to actually do hot water drilling, and that's exactly how they drill through the Antarctic ice, is use hot water to just melt the hole down uh, to the water underneath the glacier and then um, lower the submersible uh, to explore underneath. So what the project is trying to do is understand um, the temperature gradients uh, of the water underneath the glacier um, understand why that's causing melting and you know basically what's happening is as the sea water globally the temperature has risen that warmer temperature water is undercutting the glacier from below uh, so it's really eroding it and that's probably what will eventually cause it to calve. Um, there also are computational models to look at the flow of the water and the stresses and, and fluid flow of the ice itself but it's really about trying to understand those dynamics um, so we, we have some sense of what might happen uh, and how we deal with it. Uh, and I'd be happy to talk more about that later. There's also a lot of uh, basic biology work taking place. There's a large aquarium at McMurdo Station in the, in the uh, Cray Center that I mentioned. Uh, you can see some of my colleagues here pictured in the aquarium. Um, one of the things they do is send out divers uh, to capture um, various uh, uh, organisms that live in the waters. And yes, there are fish in the Antarctic waters. They have glycocol uh, in them, basically antifreeze uh, um, in their bloodstream to keep them freezing, uh, which really allows them to stay alive in, in such frigid waters. Um, so uh, divers collect those, the aquarium has them for study. One of the really interesting things about um, um, evolutionary dynamics in Antarctica is that uh, there are a lot of small organisms, but also giantism. Um, so um, sea spiders, and, and that's really uh, what this image is on the right, uh, tend to grow to very large size relative to other environments. Uh, and some of that's due to lack of predators, um, but just some adaption to the ecological niche. There's some other things that might surprise you. There's a balloon facility in Antarctica. Um, this is a partnership with NASA uh, that runs it. Uh, why balloons in Antarctica? Well, one of the really interesting things is the winds in the continent level are circular. So if you could launch a high altitude balloon, it will circle the continent for months. And so there are many projects that really are looking at how to get the equivalent of what would otherwise be satellite observations for science purposes. But with a high altitude balloon, they can launch them into the upper stratosphere, have them circle the continents for months and capture data. Uh, and so there were a couple projects working on balloon launches when you were there. Uh, one called Super Tiger, which is really trying to look at the uh, uh, the heliosynthesis, the creation in stars of, of heavy elements. Uh, and then uh, another project called BLAST, uh, which is looking at star formation issues. Uh, and so we had a chance to talk to both of the teams uh, who've been working on these projects for years. Uh, and just after uh, I left, um, BLAST, uh, and BLAST is an acronym, stands for Balloon Born Large Aperture Submillimeter Telescope the next generation. So a nod to Star Trek there. It's really trying to understand uh, um, stellar uh, solar evolution and materials. Um, they made seven attempts to launch. Um, and, and on the seventh attempt, they succeeded. Why were the others aborted? Largely because of variations in high altitude winds and sometimes because of ground weather. 
So they launched in early January of this year. Um, unfortunately, they had a mechanical failure and after uh, just a few days, they had to, uh, had to bring the balloon down. And so a lot of disappointed researchers because of that, but a great example of taking advantage of the unique environment to conduct research there. So let me give you a little bit of geographical tour of uh, where we visited around the continent and then say a little bit about uh, the South Pole Station. Um, as I said at the outset, we tend to think of Antarctica as snow and ice covered, but there actually are substantial fractions of the, of the continent that are truly barren, very low humidity, um, and the mountains prevent the flow of ice from glaciers. And so uh, it's actually one of the most extreme deserts in the world. Uh, almost nothing living there, low humidity, um, and just dirt. Um, and so uh, just interesting to see that uh, contrast from popular imagination. Of course, we know in the past that Antarctica, you know, was filled with forests uh, and uh, wildlife. There are lots of fossil records there. Uh, it just sort of speaks to how the climate of the planet continues to evolve. So let's take a look. Um, I'm going to tell you um, sort of where we visited. So you can see on the bottom right there, McMurdo Station uh, and Scott Base. Uh, that's uh, one of the first bases that uh, Scott, that I mentioned at the outset, uh, built a provision store. Uh, it's within walking distance of McMurdo Station. I'll show that in a moment. Uh, Cape Royds uh, is where Shackleton's Nimrod hut was built. I'll um, show you some pictures of penguins there. And then you can see on the left, truly, how much of that area is dry, uh, the dry valleys. And what I'm going to show you is, is some pictures of visiting the Taylor Valley uh, and Lake Fryo, which is a under glacier lake. Uh, so let's, let's sort of take a look. Um, you can see the edge of, of Taylor Glacier here. It's about um, 30 miles or so long, um, flowing down to the end of the Taylor Valley uh, toward the, uh, uh, the bay there. Um, so what's interesting about this glacier, unlike others you might have heard about, is that it's, it's called a cold-based glacier, which means the bottom is actually frozen to the ground, uh, unlike other glaciers that are wet-based, so there's, there's a, uh, a film of liquid water underneath um, that they glide on. This glacier is actually frozen to the ground underneath, and so that affects the, the dynamics of, of how it moves. Uh, you can see sort of the history in this picture of uh, the layers that have built up over time um, uh, in, in the glacier. Uh, so we took off from McMurdo on a National Science Foundation helicopter. Yes, there are a few helicopters there. Uh, and flew over the bay to land at the edge of uh, Taylor Valley uh, to visit Lake Fryall. Uh, you can see some of the mountains in the background there. Lake Fryall is, is a frozen lake. It's about uh, two and a half to three miles long. Um, and uh, there's a lot of, of biological research uh, that takes place uh, at Lake Fryall. In fact, there are a lot of young scientists, postdocs and graduate students who camp there for multiple months at a time. So think about what it's like to live in a tent in Antarctica uh, for a few months. There are some hardy souls doing that. There are um, some research stations that house equipment um, that can be used to analyze biological samples, uh, to study water samples, uh, and do other kinds of experiments in place. Some of those samples are in fact packaged and sent back to research institutions at various places in the U.S. But there's some experiments that need to be on site um, and not just for capture, but for data analysis. Uh, and that's the reason for some of those facilities. And they're packaged in a series of little huts like this. So earlier I mentioned there was a big tent facility in McNerdo. That's where these tents come from. Um, they are repaired, packaged, and used by multiple expeditions uh, as people go out to conduct scientific research. Here's a famous picture of what's known as Blood Falls. Um, this is um, flowing from the tongue of the Taylor Glacier that I showed you before. This is actually iron oxide, rust, 
uh, carried by water uh, at the edge of the glacier. And you can see how it's colored uh, the dry land uh, down below. Here's sort of another look at the dry valleys. As I said, there's really very little precipitation, just a little bit uh, of snow, uh, but mostly it's just, it's barren uh, rock and sand. Um, it's extremely windy. Uh, we flew out uh, over these areas uh, in a helicopter, uh, about six or seven of us, um, and landed um, on one of these plateaus got out and, and took this picture. And you can see I'm squinting into the sun here. Um, these rocks are called ventifacts. Uh, they're stones that have been carved by the persistent winds. Really amazing from an artistic perspective to see the, the shapes that are created. Uh, really very beautiful. Uh, just looking at the, the valley and the absence of snow in most places and these extraordinary shapes. Uh, so it was a really great photo opportunity. Uh, and so we, we stopped and wandered around and took some individual and group photos uh, as part of that. And you can see here I am wearing big red. Uh, it's relatively warm, as I said, at this time near McMurdo. You can see uh, I've got um, my uh, overpants uh, over my pants um, and uh, uh, thermal underwear and other gear under the uh, uh, under the, uh, the coat and then pockets filled with all the other things uh, to be handy to put on uh, in, in when it's colder. And believe me, there were other places uh, where I needed this. Um, just some extraordinary formations uh, in the, the glacier. And you can see the abrupt effects of transitional winds here uh, and how it's carved off at the edge of the glacier and punched some holes into it. But uh, just really beautiful uh, to look at in addition to being scientifically interesting. So let me circle back to McMurdo Station for a moment um, and talk about uh, Scott's Discovery Hut. I remember Scott's team, they were the ones who were lost on the attempt at the South Pole, having just been scooped by a Munson's team by just a few weeks. But this was built before that attempt. It was built uh, during the 1901-1904 era. Um, it's just a few hundred yards from the core of McMurdo. So if you were to walk from what circle there, which is the hut, down that road, which you can kind of see running at the around the edge of the bay, and loop back around uh, behind, that's exactly where McMurdo Station is. So it was easily possible for me to walk from where I was staying down to Hut Point. And as you would expect, uh, the hut was built there to store supplies and provisions. It was used by both Sha uh, Scott and by Shackleton. Um, and it was right on the edge of the bay there, so it was easily accessible by ship to offload supplies. When it was first built, um, the, the folks who were planning to actually overwinter there said it was so cold and miserable in the hut that they preferred to stay on the ship. Uh, that was docked just offshore because it was much warmer and much more comfortable. Um, and this is not the hut that was used for uh, Scott South Pole attempt. Uh, it was for an earlier expedition. It is now a protected historic site, a uh, partnership with the U.S. and New Zealand. Uh, so it's really a museum. I thought I would just show you a couple pictures of it. Um, so all of these materials were brought in by ship. Uh, at the beginning of the 1900s. Uh, and it's been uh, preserved now, as I said, as a historic site. You can see the monument marker uh, down on the lower left there that, uh, that notes that it's a preserved historical site. Um, here's a look inside. Um, you can see uh, there are still a lot of provisions and supplies there. And one of the common themes was that explorers would often use caches left of supplies left by previous explorers. Um, some dog biscuits as well. Um, dogs have a long history in Antarctica. Um, they were used to, to pull sledges uh, to transport materials for a lot of these expeditions. Uh, but dogs are no longer allowed on the continent. Um, they were banned in 1993, uh, largely due to fears that dogs would spread canine distipper, 
to the local seals. Uh, and you know, it's been a long time since dogs were used as sledge animals in Antarctica. They were more there as pets and, and friends, but in 1993, even that ended uh, to protect the local wildlife. So let's go around the bay uh, from McMurdo to Cape Royds. Uh, this is Shackleton's Nimrod hut. Uh, it was named after the uh, ship that uh, he sailed in to explore, uh, which was, duh, called the Nimrod. Um, his crew um, landed there. This was the 1907-1909 expedition uh, and was really arguably the first successful expedition to Antarctica. As I said before, it was this expedition that got as close to the pole as really possible before Amundsen got there less than a, uh, about 100 miles from the pole. Uh, a lot of scientific work done during this expedition. Uh, it was the first time that anyone climbed Mount Erebus back around the bay there close to uh, uh, McMurdo Station. Um, and uh, the hut is also uh, a historic site. Here's sort of a longer term view. We flew out there by helicopter, landed up the hill uh, and then walked down to the station. Um, and it is incredibly well preserved, uh, really nicer than, than Scott's hut uh, at Hut Point near uh, McMurdo. A uh, lot more provisions, um, candles, other food and supplies. Um, here's um, Shackleton's signature on, on one of the crates. Um, and you can see other things up in the top center there. Um, there are some spices uh, still sitting there, uh, but everything is preserved. Uh, you can see a sleeping bunk down at the bottom, uh, a bunch of uh, overshoes and shoes still stacked there, um, but um, pretty much been preserved for most of the last hundred years. These are original materials uh, from over a hundred years ago. Also at Cape Royds, i um, show you a little bit of, of wildlife. Um, so Cape Royds is kind of around the bay from McMurdo Station. Um, and uh, in it, that's, as I said, is where uh, Shackleton's uh, Nimrod hut is. So we went down and visited the hut and then uh, we trooped around, basically around the edge of the bay to take a look at, at the wildlife there. Um, this is a skua. Um, it is probably the most common bird in Antarctica, um, and it feasts mostly on penguin eggs. Uh, in a particular, the common species of penguins in Antarctica are the deli penguins. Um, they're pretty much common along the entire coast. It's really the only habitat for this species of, of penguins. Um, they pair and mate for life. Uh, and the, uh, the male and the female take turns keeping the eggs warm uh, while the other penguin goes uh, off to find food in the water and bring it back um, to keep, to feed the chicks after they hatch. Um, and so there's a natural competition. The skuas wait for um, the penguins uh, to perchance leave the nest and swoop in and uh, eat the eggs. And so part of the vigilance of the of either the male or female, whoever is sitting on the eggs, uh, is to, to protect the eggs from, from the skuas. Uh, here's a, just a different view of a skua. Uh, and then we walked on down to take a look at the penguins. And you can see here uh, down um, in both the lower right and in the uh, uh, close up, you can see the penguins sitting on their nests uh, to keep the eggs warm. Uh, and what you can see beyond the, the edge of the land there is the, um, uh, is the edge of the bay. And so what happens is penguins, uh, one, uh, either the male or the female, will get a troop off, uh, collect food in the water, uh, and then come back uh, to feed the chicks after they have hatched. Um, as I said, uh, they pair bond for life uh, and they rendezvous um, every year, uh, typically at the same place build a nest, uh, and then the eggs uh, are laid there. Here's, here's an example of one of the penguins who's wandered off um, uh, either, um, I don't know whether going for food or coming back, uh, but uh, really an arduous journey. Uh, one of the things that sometimes happens is one of the penguins will go off to seek food, 
you know, may not come back um, because they may have been killed by something or some reason. Uh, and then the, uh, the remaining penguin that's sitting on the eggs or then uh, needs to feed the chicks, you know, just suffers and may die itself because of lack of food. So let me end by talking about going to the South Pole, and then we'll take some questions. Um, this is an LC-130. You can see um, the skis under the bottom of the plane. It's a ski version of, as, as I said before, the venerable C-130 military transport plane. Uh, you can see that this plane's operated by the New York National Guard. They rotate down to, to uh, uh, Antarctica every year. Um, there are a lot of commercial airline pilots who, uh, who are in the, the National Guard and it was fun to talk to them uh, about this was a, a different task uh, than their normal commercial aviation job of flying to Antarctica. Um, the flight from McMurdo Station to the South Pole is about three hours. Um, because it's normally so cold at uh, the South Pole, even in the warm summer season, planes can only stay a few hours. Uh, and what's somewhat interesting uh, is that when you land at um, the South Pole, fuel is pumped off of your plane. Uh, because really the only way to get uh, fuel to uh, the South Pole is either via these planes, um, and there's also a transport mechanism that's overland sledges. Basically, a, a ground transport vehicle drags a set of supplies on a sledge um, overland to reach um, um, the pole. Basically, the same kind of model that uh, Scott and Amundsen used um, to reach the pole 100 plus years ago. Um, we went out um, the first time to go, and there was a fuel leak on the plane. And literally, I could see it drip, drip, drip from the plane, of the, uh, the wing of the plane. And I'm thinking, this is not good. So we waited and they, they said, we think we've got it repaired. We went back out to the plane and, but nope, there's a bucket under the wing still dripping uh, fuel. Um, and so we went back and waited some more and eventually got on another plane uh, that was also taking some emergency oxygen supplies to the South Pole uh, for someone who was sick. Uh, and so we did eventually get there after multiple attempts. Um, you know, this is me about to board and in the uh, cockpit with the pilot that's uh, uh, from the uh, New York uh, National Air National Guard flying uh, to the pole. Um, we landed. This is the back picture of, of the, the station itself. Uh, it's named after a Munson and Scott uh, operated by the U.S. And I should say there are multiple stations in Antarctica operated by multiple countries. The U.S. is by far the biggest. Uh, the New Zealand station uh, is very close to McMurdo, but the Russians, the Chinese, the Italians, um, and the Australians, among others, also have presence uh, on, the, uh, uh, on the continent at various locations. This is the actual um, South Pole station. Um, multiple stations have been built. Uh, over the years. This one is elevated. Um, you can't see it in this picture, but about 12 feet off the ground. And that's a lot of snow to blow underneath it during the winds. Um, there were about 60 people who are permanently based at uh, the South Pole Station. Um, you know, scientists and support people for those. Um, science is the primary reason to be at the pole because it's an incredibly inhospitable environment. Uh, and there's several scientific instruments that um, the National Science Foundation operates there. Uh, there's the ice cube neutrino detector, which in essence is looking at um, the almost massless neutrinos that go penetrate the entire Earth and are detected at the South Pole. Um, there's a South Pole telescope there, uh, which is um, really looking for uh, echoes of the Big Bang, the cosmic mic uh, microwave background radiation. Um, there's something called uh, BICEP, uh, which is um, looking at uh, um, extra galactic um, um, CMB uh, data as well. Um, the regions around the station are allocated for different kinds of scientific instruments. So there's an area that they try to keep radio quiet. Uh, that's the quiet sector. 
there's a downwind sector, um, um, and there's a bunch of atmospheric and, and climate measurements taking place. There's a dark sector, and as you would expect, that's really aimed at, uh, at telescope protection. Uh, and then there's a region where um, um, the ice cube detector uh, is located as well. Um, here's actually a picture of the, uh, the bicep and keck array. Um, I just want you to think about what it's like when they have an equipment malfunction when it's minus 70 degrees Fahrenheit and the wind is howling and it's dark because it's the dead of winter. Your job is to suit up in warm gear, go out there and make uh, technical repairs. That's a pretty arduous task. Inside the center, um, there are a host of research facilities. This is just a picture of several of us talking to some of the grad students and postdocs uh, who are stationed there. As I said, there are about 60 people uh, able to stay there. Um, all supplies come in either via that ground sledge I mentioned or they come in um, via air. Um, remember what I said about Amundsen and Scott? Um, Amundsen got there first um, and he said we arrived and were able to plant our flag and Scott wrote um, just a month later we reached the pole but uh, under different circumstances than we expected. I, we have been beaten to the punch and sadly uh, they died on the return. I was able to take the U flag uh, and flash the U. Um, this is the ceremonial South Pole. Uh, you can see the U.S. flag there um, and um, uh, the Japanese flag and others. Um, so great photo opportunity. Uh, and then uh, just around the corner, maybe a couple hundred feet, is the actual geographic pole. And remember, um, the ice is moving. Is we're not actually standing on the ground. So um, the above surface location of the pole moves. I mean, the, the actual pole doesn't, but the ice relative to it does. And so they periodically remeasure and plant that. So I had a great chance to uh, have a picture taken there with the US flag standing at the bottom of the world. And the last thing I wanna tell you about is leaving. Um, so uh, we were delayed multiple days in McMurdo of uh, flying back. And on our last attempt, the one we finally left, we had they were we were told we had a 90 minute weather window. Um, and if we didn't make it in that window, we were probably going to be there for multiple days, maybe another week. So, um, you know, it's getting closer to the end of the year and we wanted to come home. But equally importantly, there were a bunch of service personnel uh, who really wanted to get home to see their families uh, for the end of year holidays and for Christmas. Uh, so we get on the plane. We're all excited. Uh, it's snowing like heck, as you can see in this picture. Uh, plane's barely visible. Um, so we're all set to go. And we start to taxi down um, the snow-covered runway. And you know what it's like when they push the throttles forward. You feel the acceleration. You think, okay, we're going. So, and then they pull the throttles back. And you can feel the plane turn and we taxi, taxi, taxi. Plane turns again, same things, throttles slam forward. We try a second time, throttles pulled back, turn, taxi, taxi, taxi. The loadmaster in the back of the plane, the person responsible for making sure all the cargo is secure, the people are secure, yells at all of us, last chance. Um, and what she meant was that uh, we, we only had a few minutes to make it. If we didn't make it in this attempt, we would not have enough fuel to get to Christchurch. Remember what I said, you, you want to leave with just enough fuel, leave all the fuel you can in Antarctica. So third time we're thinking, if we don't make it, we're going to be here for days. So again, throttles forward. And the reason they kept going back and forth is they couldn't get enough speed to take off. And they were hoping that with multiple attempts, they were compacting the snow enough that they could get more ground velocity. The third time, the plane lumbers, labors, labors, just barely gets enough speed to get off the ground. And all of us cheer because we're, we're going to make it. So we get in the air and the loadmaster says, all right, I need to give you the safety briefing. You know, welcome to Antarctic Airlines. We know you have a choice in airlines. Oh, wait, no, actually, you don't. Um, and then says, let me tell you about um, um, oxygen masks. We do have them, they're on the walls behind you. 
So if by any chance it looks like uh, uh, you need to use them, I want you to do the one thing that your mother told you never to do. Take this clear plastic bag, pull it over your head, and tighten it at your neck, and oxygen will flow. And I'm thinking, okay, I can do that. And then she points to the life vest and says, uh, we have life vests too, but uh, I, you know, whether you wear them or not is up to you. And I'm thinking, huh? She says, you know, just know that if you, we go down in these waters, um, your mean lifetime is a couple minutes. So if you decide to put it on, it's fine. Just know you'll wear it the rest of your life. And that sounds funny, but I, just a few weeks later, um, a Chilean C-130 went down in those waters going to Antarctica and everyone was lost. So much more serious than my levity might suggest. There are some risks there. When we landed in Christchurch uh, and, and disembarked, um, the ground crew turned to one another and I heard them say, uh, we'll need to tow this plane tomorrow because it's basically out of fuel. So that's the story. Um, delighted to, to uh, answer some questions uh, about anything you might want to know about Antarctica. Thank you, Dan. Uh, we have a couple of questions about sort of administration of Antarctica. Could you describe a little bit about who is in charge of granting permission to the continent and how many countries are collaborating? We had a question in particular about the Chilean station, if you went to the Chilean station. Um, so what, under what authority were you there? So, um, so first of all, there is an international treaty that was sat, signed initially in 1959, I believe, uh, as part of what was the International Geophysical Year. Remember, that was also the time that the first U.S. Uh, exploration rockets were underway as part of that. So there were multiple countries uh, signatories to the treaty. The U.S. was one of the original signatories. It spells out certain kinds of behaviors uh, that are expected of countries. There have been environmental uh, protection agenda since then. So it's really governed by those treaties. Um, I did not visit the Chilean station. I was able to go over and visit uh, the New Zealand station, uh, had dinner there, talked to the station leaders, visited their research facilities, but it's really international treaty. Having said that, there is international competition. Um, the U.S. is in Antarctica at scale really for two reasons. Uh, one is science. Uh, the other is sort of, um, uh, if you will, a, a polite, a very gentlemanly global power struggle. Um, the National Science Foundation is the U.S. operator of Antarctic facilities by delegated authority from the U.S. State Department. Okay. I know that we have uh, Jim Carner, who's a professor of geology and geophysics, who does research down there about uh, meteorites. We had a question from one of our participants about what impressed you the most about the research that you saw um, the research labs, what was the state of the research labs, um, and what did you think of the research goals? So um, we're about to spend another $250 million to upgrade infrastructure in Antarctica. Uh, that's a project that was actually delayed because of COVID-19. Uh, and you sort of get once a year shot at this given the, the, the weather and climate. Um, but um, the research that impressed me most was certainly the glacial studies, understanding the melt and the international collaboration there, um, the, as well as talking to some of the young researchers who are really excited about the high altitude balloon work. But the South Pole facilities, uh, one of the questions that's always interesting is, what are things you can only do there? And that was a question we regularly ask people, you know, tell us, what is unique about being here? And there certainly are some unique biological aspects. It was great to talk to some of those people about um, unique uh, um, fauna uh, that exists in, in Antarctica. But you know, the physics, uh, the astronomy, um, and really the geology of understanding what was going on with respect to glaciers, those have pretty profound personal consequences for each of us. We had a question about the composition of the rocks when you had that photo of the eroded rock that you were standing next to. Do you know what the composition of that rock was? I don't. I apologize. I'm not a geologist, uh, so I, I, can't, uh, I can't tell you that. Chances are if you Google dry valleys, 
um, and geology, you, you will probably get an answer to that. Um, um, we didn't have any geologists with us. Uh, we, had, um, we had an engineer. Uh, we had me as a computer scientist. We had a biologist. Uh, and then uh, um, some of the uh, Science Foundation uh, staff. So didn't have a working geologist with us or I'm sure he or she would have, uh, would have given us a more detailed explanation. So I apologize, I can't answer that one. Could you tell us about uh, the other kinds of jobs there? We had a particular question about electrical engineers, but uh, I know that you met other people, including some folks from Utah who are working down there. Could you talk a little bit about sort of support staff and the other kinds of jobs that are done there? Absolutely. And, and you know, to use maybe an apt analogy, um, the research staff are really, they're the above water part of an iceberg. Um, for every person who's doing science, there are probably 20 or 40 that are providing logistics support. So for example, um, I talked to a fellow Utah who, uh, whose job was to drive vans um, to transport people back and forth from um, the, um, uh, the places where plane lands uh, to uh, various parts of the station, out to the helicopter pads. Uh, and they were um, really interested in the winter adventure part. So there are people who are cooks. There are people who drive ground transport. There is a really large machine shop to repair all the ground vehicles. So they're machinists. Um, and, uh, you know, there are people who maintain the facilities, the tent supply. There's a large set of staff who work to repair tents, to refurbish equipment, to package it who deal with um, logistics. There is a weather station there. So there are people who uh, do meteorology, both for uh, air transport, but also for scientific purposes. Uh, so there are a whole wide range of people. Um, and on the electrical engineering perspective, as a computer scientist, that ISFIN remote probe is pretty cool. That's a group of engineers, a bunch of electronics in that, uh, remote cameras, remote control. Uh, so there's a wide range of things there. Uh, there are a group of people there who are there to support, but in part, their personal motivation is really um, personal adventure. It's pretty cool to say I work in Antarctica. Uh, there are some people who come back year after year. Uh, and one story I didn't mention, there's a great group of middle school teachers who for most of the last 20 years have been volunteering uh, to watch, ban, and track the penguins, um, both for scientific research to understand, you know, what the mating patterns are and, and uh, the life cycle, but they also capture video and provide educational content back to teachers across the U.S. And we had a chance to talk uh, to some of those, and they had written middle school books about penguins and science, and so sort of that great intersection of education and scientific discovery uh, and a little bit of sense of adventure. And finally, would you like to return to Antarctica at some point? It was the experience of a lifetime. You know, I got to go some places that literally only a, a handful of people get to go. Um, the, the South Pole itself being a primary example of that. Um, sure, I'd love to go back, uh, and who knows, I might, because part of my uh, role as an overseer of the base is to track what's happening. And as I said, um, we're about to embark on a quarter billion dollar upgrade of facilities there uh, to support more research, to reduce the environmental footprint. Um, but it is one of those absolute bucket list things. Um, every year, a handful of people get to go um, and it's not, uh, it's not a trip you can buy with money, uh, just an extraordinary adventure. Thank you, Dan, for sharing this story. My pleasure.